we are primarily made of water. All life on this planet depends on water. You can live in a place your entire life and uh, see it in one way. You know, you sort of see it in a box. I want us to know where our water comes from. What we're doing here is telling a story, and there's, there's loads of facts in this. You could chop this river up a million times and give us so many facts and figures and numbers and charts and all that stuff. But to really set the hook, you've got to make it personal and you've got to, you, you've got to make people care. I need you. Whoa. I got it. <laughs> I got it. What this has helped me do is really try to open my eyes to how water intersects with our lives and with all life. There are a few basic things that we need to be alive. When it boils right down to it, there's a few things that sustain us. I always think about the creeks and the rivers being the arteries, you know, that, that move through the landscape. It's what gives life. Watersheds are, after all, communities. They're neighborhoods that connect us all. And what better way to do it than to travel through that watershed and to touch as much of it as you can. And I think it's important that everyone that uses this water understands you know, what it takes to get it. We have this tiny little wedge of water that we all need to survive. We all need to be able to share it. We all need to be able to understand it. That's a pretty powerful thing. Much like water evaporates to the sky, falls from the clouds, and is reinvested into the earth, Platte Valley Companies reinvests into the communities we serve. We take your deposits and lend them out to your neighbor, the coffee shop down the street, and the farmer north of town. Those funds are recirculated into our local economy, business, and back to our neighbors. Platte Valley Companies. Banking. Insurance. Investments. Funding also comes from the Cooper Foundation, serving Nebraska since 1934 with grants for education, human services, the arts and humanities, and the environment. Additional support provided by Marshall Borchert, Marjorie Nicholson, and Michael Hurley, proud sponsors of Follow the Water. On a warm August night in Lincoln, Nebraska, friends meet to celebrate the anniversary of an adventure. I hope we didn't forget that it's our anniversary. It's our first. How about a hug? Oh, congratulations, my friend. I bought it. No, I bought it. It's a journey that came to an end exactly a year ago today. Is this the one I used? Yeah, I should probably, I could like refinish it maybe. And, but that makes it even better. I think this follow the water trip began with friendship. 105, 104. Filmmaker Pete Stegan is an expert cyclist and outdoorsman. Award-winning photographer and author Mike Forsberg has spent the past 20 years exploring his home, the Great Plains. And I don't know if a lot of people look at this place as having any value at a glance. I like going to places where you can, where you can get up really high and you can just you can look and take it all in. It's just got a real, real spirit about it. And this is one of those places. The North American Great Plains is an arid land of grasslands and rivers, where the flow of water shows no respect for state boundaries. What do you learn if you try to follow that water? Is this our channel? I don't know. 
you got to figure out how to do it. Where are you going to start? Where are you going to end up? And how long is it going to take you? It would be an adventure, as well as a process of discovery. They would follow a mythical drop of water for 1,300 miles through three different states. That was probably the most intense storm that I've ever been in. They knew they couldn't do it alone. Friends would join them, help guide them, and even rescue them when they got in trouble. All of this time, all of our energy, all of our planning, it was totally at risk. We thought that this was the end. It's a 12-hour drive west from Lincoln, Nebraska, to the headwaters of the North Platte River in Wyoming. Pete's wife, Kelly Seacrest, drives the van that carries supplies for the biking parts of their journey. It'll take the travelers almost two months to bike, hike, and canoe from the Sweetwater River to the mouth of the Platte, where it flows into the Missouri. Mike Forsberg begins his journal on the very first day. July 1st, Sweetwater Sunrise. Water from melting snowpack glides over a beaver dam in the upper reaches of the Sweetwater River in Wyoming's Wind River Range. Our two-month journey to traverse the Platte River Basin begins here. They're at the foothills of the Wind River Range, extending 100 miles across western Wyoming with lakes, glaciers, and vast wilderness beyond the tree line. It probably would have led us to this trail that you see behind you. Renowned earth science professor Craig Thompson meets them at the start of the adventure. We're on the boundary between the Pacific drainage off to my right, and the Atlantic drainage off to my left. And these are the headwaters of the North Platte River. If you can imagine a knife blade and a drop of water falling on that knife blade, well, part of the drop would go off either side. If you look around us, almost all of the landforms you see are going to be shaped by the forces of wind and water. Water essentially is the mechanism that shapes the land itself. We left the mountains. The air was cool, a slight breeze coming off the peaks. We packed up and hopped on the two track and pedaled through the sage. We were on our way. Immensity is the word that keeps coming back to me of space, of sky, of horizon. They're traveling through the Platte Basin watershed, 90,000 square miles of geography, tied together by the pull of gravity on water. Everyone lives in a watershed, rivers and streams flowing into a larger body of water. But why should anyone care? Where does your water come from? So. If you ask somebody out on the street where their water comes from, you know, most people will say it comes from the tap, it comes from a faucet. But it's something that we have to think about, I think. And it's a story that we can all connect with. So why not tell that story? I think doing a trip like this, you see how things are connected. You see the relationships. And you see how people can come together through the environment, how it's like a bonding opportunity. You can look at a watershed from so many different perspectives, and you can come to it from so many different angles because it touches everything. Mike and Pete have followed the Sweetwater River all the way from its source at the Wind River Range. But as it flows past Independence Rock, the Sweetwater will soon come to an end. 
I'm just coming up around the bend here and the sun's setting behind me. Pete's already down on the bridge and we got just a, just a little bit to go. It's been a hell of a ride. <laughs> Man, what amazing country. Is this it? Let's go. <laughs> Pathfinder Dam, completed in 1909. Composed of granite blocks quarried from the same stone that forms the river's canyon. Here, the Sweetwater River joins the North Platte in a giant reservoir. For the past several years, specially designed camera systems have been watching the Pathfinder Dam and Spillway, part of an ambitious project in partnership with the University of Nebraska. Platt Basin Time Lapse, PBT for short. Mike Forsberg co-founded PBT in 2011 with artist and filmmaker Michael Farrell. I think these big ones are probably 70, 80 years old, just based on the... You can compress that time that would take a year or two or 10 years or whatever into seconds of video. And you can see the change unrolling right before your eyes in a way that you can't see it any other way. We all know what time-lapse pictures are. You see clouds scudding through the sky. You see flowers opening, things that happen on a short term. What we're trying to do is take that principle and apply it to a decade worth of change on this river system. There's a record that will have value that is not apparent to us because we won't be around to see how people use them. These are gonna be very important documents a century from now. But to Forsberg and Farrell, PBT is more than a network of time-lapse cameras. It's a community of people who care about water. Friends who've invited them to install cameras in unexpected places. So we have 50, 60 cameras out on the landscape now. Each is a point on a map. So as we were moving through the watershed, we were connecting dots. And at the end, you sort of turn around and you look back and there's the picture, there's the story. The first chapter of that story ends at Pathfinder. Okay, you want me to take a picture? Yeah. For me, the number one thing is water. I've been really drawn to trying to paint water and trying to capture it in different areas, whether it's rippling or the light reflecting or if it's deep water or a river. When you draw something or you paint something, you get to know it in a different way. One of those is grits. It's grits, we're in the deep south. The easy part is over. Soon, Mike and Pete will be pushing themselves to the limit. Spoon for serving. Day seven. We've given up our bikes for hiking boots and backpacks. We've arrived at Lake Agnes, almost 11,000 feet above sea level. From here, our goal is to connect the two giant sponges that form the headwaters of the North and South Platte rivers in Colorado. And so, for the next two and a half weeks, we'll be walking along the razor's edge of the Continental Divide, from North Park to South Park. Boil and boil. How does that go? Boil two friends have joined them, Lindsay Dalton and Carrie Harrelson. Carrie comes to Lake Agnes year-round. A couple of years earlier, in the middle of winter, he joined the Platte Basin time-lapse crew as they hiked up to Lake Agnes to check a camera. I got involved uh, shortly after they installed the camera at Lake Agnes. Um, they were trying to figure out how to get there in the wintertime. I said, well, ski to it. And they said, well, we can't do that. And I said, well, I, I go up there all the time and ski anyway. I'll just check it while I'm there. Much easier in August to the battery on this camera. For me, the first impression I had was, well, how beautiful to watch the time lapse, and not necessarily studying the water, but to look at the pictures. How beautiful that must be to see an entire year of water go by, because the ice up there in the wintertime is blue. It's fantastic, and to watch all that just progress through its natural cycle. There we 
go. All fixed? All fixed. Does it work? It works. But now it's midsummer in the mountains, and they're following the water. So we're going to head down the ditch today. We'll go around, and then in, what, three days, we'll end up at Grand Lake, which is just over that hump. You can kind of see a little bit of Shadow Mountain Lake. As a kayaker and avid backpacker, Kerry knows this land well. He's planned every detail of the mountain hike. Everywhere we camped, there had to be water because we were thirsty and we had to cook. We had to store that water for the next day to take with us on the places where there wasn't water. When you're backpacking like that, water is forefront in every thought. We were gonna do four days to Grand Lake and then I would planned on two days in a canoe which would get us off of our feet and get those packs off of our shoulders. Because also my experience is about three days in, things really start to hurt. To start with, you're carrying about a third of your body weight on your back. I put all the essential things I had to have with water and everything, it was around 44 pounds. And I weigh 140 pounds. And then imagine taking that up to 12,000 feet. It is going to be uphill the entire time. Each blister is going to feel like knives. Our bones are hitting the ground every time we're walking, and it's like, I can't feel my feet. We've gone up 3,000 feet, and we're just wasted. Yeah. But we can still handle and tolerate each other. That's Some families can't even say that. Where are we, Carrie? It's not just the trail, it's with hard days at work or when relationships get difficult and you want to just throw it in and say, forget it. And you work through it and tell yourself that this is a moment and that moment will be gone later. And every morning you get up and stretch out the aches and pains and I'm ready to go again. <laughs> Lindsay gave me some keen advice yesterday. She said, just think every day is going to be a bitch. <laughs> and I have. Since yesterday, I thought, I don't care what's going to be said about today being a short day or we're only going up and over that to this lake. It's going to be hard and it's going to be a challenge. We were walking right along the ditch and Mike had a little limp going. And Mike, being a man of few words as he is, uh, in particular about himself, uh, wasn't giving up any information, so it got worse and worse, and he slowed and slowed as we went. And then two days later, when we were walking into Grand Lake, this limp had not gotten any better. When you're in a, in a canoe paddling, you're not straining your knee. So, cool, it's gonna be a break. We'll see how Mike does after this break. Day 12. We paddled across Grand Lake and Shadow Mountain Lake today. These two lakes, along with Lake Granby, capture significant snowpack and rainfall in the upper Colorado watershed. What many people don't realize is that a portion of the water gets diverted into the Adams Tunnel, a 13-mile-long trans-basin diversion that moves water under the Continental Divide and Rocky Mountain National Park and delivers it to Colorado's thirsty eastern plains. Grand Lake, as much as anything else, is what ties Lincoln, Nebraska to Las Vegas, Nevada, or Los Angeles, California, or Phoenix, Arizona. This is where it happens. This is the, the pivot point. Depending on what's happening at the gate right here at Adams Tunnel, this is either the headwaters of the Colorado or the headwaters of the Platte, or both. And so this is the link that links the country. And that link is more and more being fought over. That's a lifeline is what that is. That's a, a lifeline to the Front Range. And I think it's important that everyone that uses this water understands you know, what it takes to get it. And it, it's pretty tough to, to make that connection when you walk up to the faucet and 
turn a knob and water just flows right out. There it is, magic, right? Heather Knight waters her tomatoes with groundwater, pumped from a well on her ranch near Fort Collins, Colorado. But the water to grow the hay that feeds her animals comes through a tunnel from the other side of the Continental Divide. And as more and more people move to the front range of Colorado, there's greater and greater demand for that water. To own this water, you have to buy shares in the irrigation company. So if you moved here today and you went to a listing of shares in this company, they could be as expensive as $100,000 per share. When Heather and her husband Rick Knight first came to ranch country, a share of water was just $5,000. So when Rick and I arrived here, I really wanted to know this place like the back of my hand. We see the seasons change, the wildlife move. We watch the agricultural operations. We help our neighbors. I think that's when you, know, you start to build relationships and trust with people, when you can ask them questions about what they really care about. We're right at the edge where the long, rolling grasslands hit the foot of the Rocky Mountains. It's called Phantom Canyon because when you're going across the rolling prairie and you come to the lip of a canyon that drops before your feet, it's a surprise. It's kind of hidden. It's unknown to you. You can see the foothills of the Rocky Mountains kind of perching up and rising to your west. You're about 600 feet above the canyon bottom and the river just runs right below your feet. It's not the water that is up in the snow-capped peaks, and it's not the water that's out on the plains. It's the bridge between the two, and that's an important story to tell. Heather Knight was caretaker of the Phantom Canyon Preserve when she worked with Mike Forsberg and his team to set up cameras in the canyon. We started with just one camera on the rim but we also set up uh, high-definition cameras on the trails um, to capture some of the wildlife. I remember when Rick and I were first living in Fort Collins, we went camping into the canyon and I heard this song of this bird. It was just this trilling song and I just thought, what is that bird? And I was looking for something spectacular. And it was a, a dipper, a water ouzel, and it was just this small gray bird sitting on a rock, dipping away, but singing to its heart's content. The American dipper, they have this wonderful life cycle where they go in the riffles and they dive and fly underwater, capture insects and carry them back to feed their young. They gotta go underneath the water to visit their grocery store. And aquatic insects have to have good water quality. So when I see dippers, when I hear that song, when Heather sees dippers, when she hears that song, um, we both get a big smile on our face. Day 13. Above 12,000 feet, we move through a yellow blanket of alpine wildflowers as we traverse the Continental Divide separating the Colorado and Platte watersheds. My knee started, started hurting way back in Wyoming um, while we were biking. And I thought it would go away with a couple days rest, um, but it didn't. He would stop and get down on his knees, take pictures of flowers and bees. 
so he was way behind. I was kind of in the middle, trying to not let them get out of sight, trying not to let Mike get out of sight, and trying to figure out where we were going next. Carrie contacted a friend in Denver. Dave Showalter set out on a rescue mission. I thought I was gonna trash my truck that day and had a hell of a time getting up there. And sure enough, they were right where they said they were gonna be. Carrie with his thumb out, will you pick us up? And smiling and uh, just speaks to what kind of people they are. Mike took off with Dave to see a doctor. Everyone else kept going. We were a team at that point, and uh, you never want to you never want to leave your team. And I'm glad that you know I was wearing sunglasses that day when I watched him go and disappear off into the trees because, you know, I mean. I wasn't bawling my eyes out or anything, but I had tears in my eyes because it was just hard to see them go. I was down. I was bumming. And at the time, no one on the trip knew that he would return. I was afraid our team wasn't going to be complete. But do we finish the trip? You know, I had no idea. Carrie or Lindsay or I should have packed a little violin. And I think we should have been playing it when he was not there, because it was, it was sad. It was, it, our team wasn't complete. Without him, the whole thing was completely at risk. The trip was at risk. They had been preparing to climb Gray's Peak at more than 14,000 feet, the highest point on the North American Continental Divide. When we made the plan, we were very worried if he'd ever come back. Emotionally, we were avoiding the conversation of what happens if, he, if, he's, if his knee was shot. Mike just got the news that his knee's good, he got a cortisone shot, and he's like rip roaring, let's, let's do it. Having him back part of the team, it was like, okay, we're back again. It was a huge relief. They spent the night at a motel in Georgetown, Colorado. So Gray's Peak was Mike's first day back, and he was gung-ho about getting up this mountain. They began the climb at 2 a.m. in total darkness and reached the peak at dawn. You can look off to the west, and you can just see these ragged, jagged peaks going clear off in the distance. But you look off to the east, and you can see that flat, hazy horizon off in the distance that are the plains. Um, that's my home. And to get up there for sunrise and moonset at the same time on the highest peak on the Continental Divide at the top of the Platte Basin watershed, it's the most magical thing. And I think, you know, things are memorable when they're hard sometimes. You don't, you don't remember bluebird days when everything just went easy. I guess in my mind, I thought that was going to be the hardest part of the day. And, you know, here we are, the sun is rising and the hardest part is over. And the group got together and we turned to head over the ridge to continue our trek for that day. And I saw what was next. You're not walking a path anymore. It's up and down and, and scaling rocks and, and scrambling. But there was no other way to get there. We had to get from, from Gray's Peak over to Argentine Peak, and that was the way to do it. So we've just dropped about 3,000 feet from the top of Argentine. And I'll spin around and show you where we came from. Made a little Parmesan truffle couscous. Mm -hmm. On top, we got some sun-dried tomatoes. On day 21, they camped near Geneva Creek, about 30 miles west of Denver. 
and then we're gonna come up here. There's a ditch here. This is a reservoir. We're gonna walk over here. We're gonna go over here and uh oh. We fall off the map. The world she is a flat. <laughs> we fall off. Four days later, they made it to Kenosha Pass, just outside of South Park, connecting the headwaters of the North and South Platte Rivers in Colorado's Front Range. Next, they trade backpacks for bikes and follow the water from mountains to plains. Day 27. Today, Pete and I rode our bikes into the heart of Denver along the South Platte River, marking the halfway point of our journey to traverse the Platte watershed. It's been a surreal experience in the last week, moving from the solitude of alpine tundra wilderness in the highest reaches of the South Platte watershed to the din and dizzying pace of a vibrant city of over three million people. It is sensory overload. Re-entry is hard. The suburbs of Denver are growing. It's kind of gut-wrenching. Take a good look, because this is going to be 10,000 homes. Platte Basin time-lapse cameras document the evolution of a housing development near Rocky Flats Wildlife Refuge. I've been watching the progression over time in the last several years as this development is built up, which is just emblematic of what's happening throughout the Denver metro area. Uh, we're, we're just being inundated with a lot of folks. It's, it's a great place to live, but um, the developments seem to be springing right out of the prairie. Like his friend Mike Forsberg, Dave Showalter is a conservation photographer. Interestingly, on one of my solo trips, right before the development was happening, just over there, I saw a cow elk calling to her fawn. And it was just so touching. And you don't see the elk on this side anymore. So it's changed a lot. And yeah, it will be all green lawns before too long. A PBT camera near a suburban golf course in Denver shows the ebb and flow of water. So I've seen plenty of these cycles in 30 years of living in this area, where you go through a, an extended period of drought and, and there's conservation measures that are put in place. And people grumble about it, but they go along. When we have a good snowpack year and a good water year, that all kind of gets forgotten about and we start the conversation anew. The one thing that impresses me the most is how much light there is radiating from the city. Like if you have a big cloud bank overhead, the whole business turns orange because all of that light is being absorbed in that cloud. And you get a sense of just how much humanity um, is, just, is just packed into this area uh, right on the edge of the plains. Today, we struck out across the plains, and we're really sort of starting that long, slow glide downhill. I love the mountains, and I miss them already, but I'm in love with the plains. Day 30, we reached Pawnee Buttes at sunset. A lone windmill pulling up cold, fresh water from deep below the surface stood sentinel as we crested the hill. It was a welcome sight. Somewhere yesterday, out on Colorado's eastern plains, we had crossed a line. We were now in the land of the mighty Ogallala Aquifer, one of the largest remaining aquifers in the world. Holy Grail of the High Plains. The Ogallala Aquifer, 174,000 square miles of water lying under eight states. In some parts of Nebraska, the aquifer is more than 1,000 feet deep. 
feeding countless rivers and streams. But the land itself is dry. When weather systems move across the Rockies, that air lifts up and it condenses and, and all the moisture usually falls on the west slope. So when it gets onto the east slope and out onto the high plains, there's not much water left there. So now I'm riding through that on a bike with Pete and that prairie is still there. Those grasslands are still there, but it is an industrial zone. It's bread basket, it's energy pump and all of that stuff needs water. You cannot get away from it because there's 18 wheelers every 10 minutes passing you. You know, it's, it's crazy. In some ways, it's heartbreaking. Um, look at it from another perspective, it's progress. So here's the beauty of being supported. They're about to start the next phase of their journey. Riding down the Nebraska-Wyoming state line. Yee-haw! They're headed to a place called State Line Gauge, on the border with Wyoming. It's where we measure water that's coming from the state of Wyoming to the state of Nebraska. Every drop of water in the Platte watershed is spoken for. Time to trade bikes for a canoe. From this point on, Mike and Pete will be following the Platte, a braided river meandering east through a state named for the river itself, Nebraska, Flatwater, a river full of surprises. Well, that's a new one. Yep, it's gone. What just happened, Pete? Well, I'm having a little quicksand issue. And we only got one croc. So that's what we had to go over. Get around anyway, not go over. Go over it and you're dead. We can get around it one way and do maybe about a quarter mile, uh, maybe even half mile portage. Light as a feather if you stick together. <laughs> it's like walking a dog. I need you. Got it. <laughs> Pete's looking for a opening in the dense cattails so he can get around this thing and I'm walking the boat slowly hauling our gear. Here's our path. Should have brought the machete. I don't see what the big deal is. Found a way. Nice work, Pete. You too. During their 55-day journey, Mike and Pete captured water from three sources. Melted water from a snowfield, rainwater from the sky, and water bubbling up from the ground. It was on the North Platte River, west of Oshkosh, Nebraska, and it was coming out of a spring from the ground and that was aquifer water. More than 200 miles away in north central Nebraska, a stream fed by the very same aquifer 
flows through the Nebraska sand hills. It's big ranch country, you know, it's prairie. And those ranchers are pretty damn good stewards of the land. And they know how to take care of their grass, they know how to take care of their water. The Schweitzer family has been raising cattle on land near the Calamus River for generations. Sarah Sordom helps run her family's ecotourism business, Calamus Outfitters, which brings visitors to the ranch. I think a lot of people don't think about the water. We'll always make sure that we tell them the water is very good and it's very safe to drink right out of the tap, but a lot of times they won't believe us. You know, uh, they'd rather walk over to the store and buy another bottle of water, even though we tell them the water that you're standing over is the best water in the world. Pure underground water feeds Gracie Creek on the Schweitzer Ranch, where Sarah and the Platte Basin Time Lapse team decided to put a camera. I love that camera on Gracie Creek because the different seasons, the vegetation changes, and of course there might be snow on the ground and not, and the colors change. When you speed that up in the time lapse, you see this change. And it's just like the whole place is breathing. It's so cool. Platte Basin time lapse cameras are watching the pulse of water all over the Nebraska sand hills. But those cameras don't see the whole picture. If you look at a river or a stream on a map, you see it in two dimensions. You see it across the surface. But really, you have to see it in three dimensions. You have to look at it as a cross section or in a 3D, where all of a sudden you see the groundwater that's underneath it that is feeding these rivers and streams. I always think about the creeks and the rivers being the arteries you know, that, that move through the landscape. It's what gives life. So when I think of watershed, I, I think of a community. On day 39, the travelers approach Ash Hollow State Historical Park on a stretch of the river infused with spring water from the Ogallala Aquifer. It was incredible because you actually got to stop and feel the spirit. We heard a heron take off, a great blue heron take off around a bend, and you could hear, like, you could hear the feathers of it flying away. It was so peaceful and so quiet. It was magical. It was, it was my favorite part of the river, for sure. Eventually, we weren't in a river anymore. We were in a lake. The river becomes a lake, and things are going well, and the wind starts to pick up. So we got waves in our boat. We're going across these waves, so a little, little bounce in the bow. They had entered 22-mile-long Lake McConaughey, created by an enormous earthen dam. When we entered it from the river, you cannot even see close to the dam. Like, it's, it's massive. Once these waves started happening, we started thinking, maybe this isn't safe. We ended up getting ourselves into a cove and making a phone call to Nate and said, I think we're going to need some help here. Nate Nielsen is the foreman of Kingsley Dam. I was able to find them somewhere near Sandy Beach. There was a lot of work for those guys. They, uh, they had a lot of fun, I think, but they, they were working hard. The next day, we threw the canoe in the back of his pickup truck. We drove out and uh, past the end of Lake McConaughey, and he put us back on the river below the Keystone Diversion, and 
we were on our way again. Portaging canoers over Kingsley Dam is not in Nate Nielsen's job description. And then this gate swings open and closed like this. And it, Nate maintains the right, morning glory, here, which releases water from the lake. He keeps the hydroelectric plant running and controls the rooster tail, which puts oxygen in the lake below the dam so that fish can survive. What was once a quiet stretch of the river is now big business for the state of Nebraska. We get a million people a year visiting at Lake McConaughey. I think those folks are looking for warm water, for one thing. You, you go out there to Colorado, and, and uh, the lakes up in the mountains are beautiful, but they're, they're cold. So they come out here. I think they like the sand on the beaches. 900 jobs are related to the Lake McConaughey infrastructure. So that's huge, that's, that's gigantic. Uh, the, the water that we use after Lake McConaughey that goes downstream, irrigates all this ground east of us here, they talk upwards of $800 million worth of impact. There's a PBT camera watching Lake McConaughey as it rises and falls year after year. Some years are better than others. The drought's the worst. If you don't have anything to work with, that's no good. Nobody wants the worst of the worst on floods. But uh, a little bit too much water is a lot easier to deal with than no water at all. It's nice to be able to tell the farmers in the fall that, yeah, there will be enough water for next season. It's day 47 on the Central Platte, just south of Kearney, Nebraska. For years, Mike Forsberg has been coming here to witness what many call one of the greatest wildlife spectacles on Earth. That's March, and almost 20 million sets of wings all pushing through that valley in the springtime. So to be on that river in the middle of summer, in July, in a canoe, it's just very different, you know? It's not a rock concert. It's more like a small little ensemble. It's very soft and elegant. The amount of wildlife that we've canoed through has been phenomenal. Paddling through here, I really get the sense of, I think this is what the river's supposed to be. For untold centuries, the ancestors of today's Native Americans lived a traditional life on the Great Plains. It was a world without fences, a world of free-flowing rivers. On day 52, a discovery. I picked it up, pulled it out, and like sand started pouring out of it, like wet sand. And I was like, looked at it and held it and thought, whoa, this is a bison horn. Like when was the last time that bison have been around here? Before we started putting these bridges, before we started getting a handle on the wild, the wild was here, and it was everywhere. There's so much before me. There's been so much before I have stepped in this sand. When you travel a river, you're traveling not just through a space, but you're traveling through time. This river has a history to it. And it's a deep, deep history that doesn't just contain our trip. It contains culture after culture that has made this river home, going back beyond what anybody can remember. 
you get to some places in the river that just feel different to you. They have this sacred space about them. You just know that they're special. They're coming closer to Nebraska's biggest cities, Lincoln and Omaha. Mike and I completely immersed ourselves in this watershed. And I think all of those things connected and it just led you back, it led us back home. On the last full day of their journey, the river has one more surprise for them. I had the tent set up and darkness had fallen and there was lightning flashing off in the distance. It's almost like it was a show for us, you know, it was like building and growing and lightning. That was probably the most intense storm that I've ever been in. The walls were sucking in and blowing out and sucking in. It was crazy. And we woke up the next morning and everything was glistening. The river had risen almost to flood stage. And the clear river with braided sandbars that we had been paddling through for several days prior all of a sudden was a chocolate milkshake with you know, huge piles of, of foam and huge upwellings coming from below, you know, like just like just big belches of water coming up. And we sort of looked at each other and thought, well, we've got like 14 miles to go and we can't stop now. This is amazing to see this. Well, it seemed like the water was saying, you're done, time's up. You followed me all the way to the mouth Time, time to get out. We have reached the place where the Platte River becomes the Missouri. On the bank where the two rivers meet, a final time-lapse camera captures an image of two small figures in a canoe. And if you look real close, you can see Pete and I in that boat, in that frame. Coming around this corner, Mike and I were like, well, maybe it's a little further. And I'm looking at my Garmin, looking at a phone. It's like, no, I think it's right here. I think we're right next to it. And before you know it, we're mixed with the Missouri River. And it's like, oh my goodness, we made it. They've followed a mythical drop of water over 1,300 miles through the entire Platte Basin watershed. They're exhausted but they accomplished everything they set out to do. For 55 days, we were never more than a couple feet from this water. I mean, it's, it was an intimate experience and we're lucky enough to have done it. So this comes from snowpack. Mike and Pete pour the water they've collected from snowmelt, rainfall, and the aquifer into the river. This river is me. This river is you. So you should care where your water comes from. I think it's it's so fundamental that we almost overlook it. Ready? There's certain shortcuts that you can't take in life. And if you want to tell a story, a big story, an important story. I think you have to have a tactile feel for the landscape. How are you gonna talk about things? How are, you, how are you gonna educate folks? How are you gonna do outreach if you don't get out and taste it, touch it, feel it, and maybe even struggle a little bit? We've gone from mountains to plains. We've gone along the spine of the Continental Divide, and we've floated all the way across the state of Nebraska to try to tell the story. The really beautiful story about what this water is and where it comes from 
and what it means to live in a watershed today. If you want to find where the power lies, follow the money. If you want to find where life is, just go follow the water. Much like water evaporates to the sky, falls from the clouds and is reinvested into the earth, Platte Valley Companies reinvests into the communities we serve. We take your deposits and lend them out to your neighbor, the coffee shop down the street, and the farmer north of town. Those funds are recirculated into our local economy, business, and back to our neighbors. Platte Valley Companies, banking, insurance, investments. Funding also comes from the Cooper Foundation, serving Nebraska since 1934 with grants for education, human services, the arts and humanities, and the environment. Additional support provided by Marshall Borchert, Marjorie Nicholson, and Michael Hurley. Proud sponsors of Follow the Water.